treatments to the dentist, to the dental nurse, or in the dental surgery. So let's move on and consider wireless B now. Now, wireless B is a different kettle of fish all together to that of the wireless A. Firstly, its genome is DNA. Unlike the other hepatitis viruses, which are RNA, this one is a DNA virus. And is it serious? Yes, it can be. Mortality rate is reasonably high, 10% or so in epidemics, and not can it only produce chronic disease and chronic hepatitis. Patients can become chronic carriers without actually producing liver disease. And the risk groups? Well, as I said, it's spread by blood and by body secretions. But before I talk to you about the risk groups, I want to talk to you just a little bit about the structure of the virus. As I said to you, it's a DNA virus. So if it's a DNA virus, it must have the protein, the polymerase, in order to be able to replicate itself. And indeed, it has. So the DNA of the virus and the DNA polymerase are engulfed in the nuclear capsoid of the virus. That, in turn, is covered by the core antigen. That, in turn, is covered by the early antigen. And then we have the surface antigen. Now, when the hepatitis B virus invades our body, it doesn't just target any old cell. It doesn't just go for your cardiac cell or for the neurons. It has specificity against specific receptor receptors on the hepatocytes. And it binds itself on those hepatocytes. And it enters the hepatocytes via a process known as endocytosis. Once the virus is inside the hepatocytes, alarm bells start to ring. We've been invaded. The hepatocytes are not just going to sit back and take this invasion. They're going to send virus-specific cytokines into the bloodstream, which in turn switches on the T lymphocytes. The T lymphocytes arrive at the liver with their big heavy hammer, but they can't get into the virus because the virus is inside the hepatocytes. So they start breaking the hepatocytes in order to get to the virus. As soon as the cell wall of the hepatocytes is broken, the content of the hepatocytes are released into the bloodstream. One in particular are the enzymes. Alamine aminotransferase, ALT, and aspirate aminotransferase. And we can measure that. And we know that this patient is in acute phase of hepatitis B virus. And the risk groups, as I said to you, blood and body secretions. So hemophiliacs, because of factor A, that has stopped now. Because blood is routinely tested and the positives are thrown out. Again, blood and renal dialysis. Patients and staff are at risk because of contaminated syringes and so forth. Again, blood and intravenous drug abusers. Again, because of contaminated syringes. And if you've been abroad and you've been in labor or you've had a road traffic accident and you've had transfusions in countries where they do not routinely test the blood, you can pick it up that way. And also in institutions. Mentally handicapped institutions where hygiene, for some reason or other, is poor. And semen and prostitution. And semen and homosexuality. And semen and heterosexuality. It's not a disease of dentists, doctors, and health workers. And that's how it all fits together. Blood and hemophilia. Blood and intravenous drug abusers, blood and blood transfusions from abroad, blood and dialysis, semen 
and homosexuality, semen and heterosexuality, semen and any kind of sexual activity where there is an exchange of body fluids. How do you know somebody has virus B? Well, you look for the surface antigen. Remember the structure I told you about? You look for the hepatitis B surface antigen. There is something else you look for though. That's right. The little E antigen, the L E antigen. And why do we do that? Because it tells you whether the patient is infected. So the examiner will say to you, how do you know this patient has virus B and is a danger to you? You say to the examiner, I look for the surface antigen, the hepatitis B surface antigen, and for infectivity, I look for 